The volleyball team had the opportunity to play spoiler to the visiting Northern Kentucky Norse. Could they get it done in the UPMC Event Center? The softball team powered through six games in four days of Horizon League action. New voice, but same show. This is CSC. That's right. Same voice, but different shows. I'm Colby Sherwin, and alongside me is my RMU Extra and RMU Live co-host, Austin Bechtel. Yes, Colby. It's great to be able to host CSC with you here tonight. Yeah. It's going to be a good show, so I'm really looking forward to hosting with you once again, Colby. Yeah, so uh, Tyler Gallo will join me next block for a basketball discussion, and Jack O'Brien has a night off. But Austin, we're going to talk about golf later. Yes, we are. John Hanna, our producer, is going to tell us how golf did at the Carpetbagger Classic and give us a little bit of insight on how their season is going so far. Yeah, but before that, Austin, we have some breaking news. We do have some breaking news, Colby, as Dante Tracy, according to verbal commits, has decided that he is going to transfer and leave the men's basketball program and join a long list of players for Robert Morris that are transferring from the basketball programs. You can see the numbers right here from Tracy. Great season in 2019 and 20 before the pandemic shut down the season as Robert Morris was going to the NCAA tournament with Dante Tracy being named the 2019 NEC MVP, but he just couldn't rebound this year. You can see the differential in the field goal percentage, 46.4% to 32% in the Horizon League. His points also declined 6.6 .6 per game compared to 8.7 in the NEC. Even though his assists did climb, his total point average for his career at Robert Morris in three seasons just under six, Colby. So he really wasn't very aggressive with the shot selection that he was making this year. Really more conservative and passing off the ball. And the writing, honestly, for some of us watching the games was on the wall with Tracy. And he just seemed really frustrated at times out there performing for Robert Morris and really not getting the job done this year. Yeah, I felt like he never really was able to rebound once we, they joined the Horizon League. And that really, to me, was the downfall of uh, Dante Tracy as a Colonial. That's right. Now, the, the lacrosse team was looking to continue their winning streak as they grounded Air Force last week in Colorado. To do this, they were looking to upset the Cavaliers, the Virginia Cavaliers. Were they able to outduel the Cavs? We'll start off here, 1-0 Cavs. Dan Toto goes top shelf, and he scores 1-1. Now, Jake Boudreau falls, falls down, sends a backward pass to Ryan Smith, and he scores. The Colonials go up. Now we're going to see how uh, a cross field pass to Boudreau, who makes a nice move to himself, and he scores. Now here we see the, Colony or the Cavaliers' great defense, why they're ranked higher in the country, and guess what? It's Ryan Smith, and he scores. Now great pass off defense. Uh, Will Yo uh, Johansson is like a hot knife through butters. He goes all the way down the field and sends a rocket in the net. Here we continue the game. Colonials on the man up, passing it around. Guess who? It's Ryan Smith with a uh, hat trick. And now Docs Aitken, uh, Virginia's top scorer, he's going to score in the Cavaliers' pull ahead here. We're seeing the Ca or Colonials pass it around, and Austin Popovich from behind the net. Colonials running out of time here, and they're going to do a spin move and score, but they will run out of time. Colonials lose 12-14, to 14, and the Cavaliers survive the upset scare. Now, Colby, after men's basketball concluded their season, Ethan Morrison, Nick Hedrick, and I had the chance to talk to head coach Andy Toole, and he talked to us just about how the season went in general, what the transition was like from the NEC to the Horizon League, and also how COVID played a factor in this season's team and end result. So what has been the hardest part about transitioning from the NEC to the Horizon League? Obviously, I would imagine the talent level was definitely part of it, but outside of the virus, what has been the most challenging part of it? There's been a lot of challenges to it. You know, the virus certainly didn't help it, but you know, I think the size across the board is, is something that I think we knew we would be. You know, losing Yanis Mendy, who was a guy who you know, wasn't a shot blocker, but he helped us protect the paint, protect the rim. He was a great positional defender. He was a great post defender. Uh, he would step in and take charges all the time, which you know, make people less inclined to maybe go and attack the basket. Um, you know, losing his presence on the inside was something that. You know, we That's knew right. we would have to make up for Charles Bain. Obviously, wasn't the same type of defender uh, that that Yanis was, um, and so that was something that we knew yeah. we'd have to try and improve upon. Uh, the thing we probably didn't uh, estimate, we underestimated was the lack of size in the backcourt, um, yeah. and not only because you know Cam Ferris or you know Traden or Enoch were freshmen. Uh, that that obviously puts you you know maybe physically from a strength perspective a little bit disadvantaged. But just the overall size. I mean, you, you look at 
you know, the amount of time that our guards were posted this year compared to any other time in my history here is, is dramatic. You know, I, I think guard, our guards were posted potentially more than our forwards were. Um, and so that's something that we have to, you know, try to adjust the size, the length, uh, the physicality that is a part of the league is something that we have to adjust to. Uh, I remember we were playing at USC this year and, and one of their assistants was an assistant at Bryant last year. And I was talking to him before the second game and he said, during the course of the game, one of their other assistants leaned over to him and said, are these good sized guards in the Northeast Conference? And he said, not only are they good sized guards, they're some of the better guards in the Northeast yeah. Conference, John and Dante. And, and the guy was like, wow. But that was the world we lived right. in, right? Yeah. There, was, right? There was three guys on the court almost at all times in the Northeast Conference that were probably six foot four or under, right? Now in, in, in the Horizon League, most of these teams have one or two guys on the court under six foot four, period. And so th those are the things that we have to look at as we you know, look to recruit, um, you know, size, length. Because uh, length is something that translates, right? You know, like if you're, you know, a little bit longer and a little bit taller, maybe that shot contest becomes a little bit more effective uh, versus, you know, a shorter guy closing out to you. When you're going into environments where you have some guys that might be bigger, faster, stronger, slightly more talented, and your instincts and your connectivity isn't there, it makes it harder to win. And I think in some of those close losses we had, you know, it was a handful of possessions in the first half or a handful of possessions in the second half where guys either got fatigued or had breakdowns or, you know, there were games this year, which is, it, it's crazy to say as a coach, where like, we go to play Bowling Green, or we go to play Marshall, or even Purdue-Fort Wayne early in the conference year, and we go, yeah, we haven't gone over that yet. Right? Like, yeah. we, 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 like yeah. we, when, when these guys come out of quarantine, we're trying to make sure that they're okay mentally. We're trying to make sure that we can get some baseline of conditioning. We're trying to hope that they remember, you know, our baseline out-of-bounds plays, our sideline out-of-bounds plays, and our offense. Yeah. We're trying to make sure they're generally in the right area defensively. But like some of that next level of detail you can't get to because you really need that time in, in November and December to, to build some of those habits as you're going through games. Because right. as crazy as it sounds, like even when you're in September and October, you're going through your drill work, you're creating some of those habits, no doubt. But you don't have the game as a teacher. So when you get into November and you play a game and you have a freshman make X number of mistakes and then you can practice for two or three days after that, now all of a sudden that stuff starts to get ingrained, right? Even in October, you might say to Enoch or Traden or Khalil Spear, who even though he has two years experience is still trying to learn our system, yeah, right. you say, that's not gonna work in a game. And they kind of look at you like, all right, yeah, we'll see about that. And then when the game comes and it doesn't work, you go, boom, see, that doesn't work. Here it is, this is why we gotta do it this way. And so we didn't really have some of those, those opportunities to do that, right? Yeah. And so it just made it that much more complicated. Right? And then even as we, we, we got through, you know, that, that third or wherever, the fourth quarantine, and we get to play Purdue Fort Wayne, we play Milwaukee, we go back into quarantine, right? We're two and one in the Horizon League. We had, you know, a good win at Purdue Fort Wayne. We had a grind out win here against Milwaukee. And then we come out of quarantine and we got to play UIC, NKU, and, and Wright State, you know, in consecutive weeks. And, you know, I said this to a couple people in our, and, and to our staff, like, I don't think we ever got in the proper condition to be able to compete the way you need to compete. You know, yeah. so now, you know, we have guys that are coming out of quarantine. Charles Bain's coming off a calf strain and out of quarantine, going to play UIC, who is one of the more talented teams in our league, one of the biggest, longest teams in our league. And we got to play back to back. Right? So remember, like, now, you know, like, conditioning not only allows you to play well in the game you're in, a symbol of conditioning is how quickly you can recover. Mm -hmm. So now in 22 hours, you've got to come back and play another game. That's a heck of a challenge regardless. When I was in college at Penn, the Ivy League plays back to back. I was terrible on Saturday, right? Like I, I, I struggled to recover that quickly. And so now you're looking at every one of these games being back to back and you're a little bit physically disadvantaged, you know, you know, from the jump, whether it's with size, strength, whatever. Now you throw in a, a little bit of a lack of conditioning. It becomes a real uphill. For more RMU sports news, including men's basketball and all the other sports here at Robert Morris, make sure to check out Colonial Sports Network. You'll be able to find a lot of the content, video and written content by us here at RMU Century Media and Colonial Sports Network. And you'll also be able to see the full interview with Andy Toole that we conducted a little bit later on in the next coming week. But Colby, what do we have coming up later on in the show? Now coming up after the break, Tyler Gallo, who usually hosts this show, will be, sit will be joining me to talk about everything RMU basketball. Stay with us on CSC. Oh, sweetie. Okay, you know what? Let's, let's take off his sweatshirt. 
Get rid of pictures of him. You don't have to look at him. Goodbye, Dave. Mom, you don't understand. He's tagged in like 400 of my posts. I can cut out tags. No, that's, that's not how it works. What is a tag? <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care would love to share their first with you. So recently, Gallo has been on a quite a run of good shows lately. I was a big opponent to beat there, but now they move on to the Three Rivers Classic where they've had some pretty good history and we're going to take a look at some of these games. They've won it a couple times. We're going to move on into that. But it's led to the group starting to question his morals. And that's when I said, you can't wear a sweater vest. Ian Kist wore a sweater vest. Hang on. Let's go time. Seeing this? You seeing these? Can't believe it. You this. seeing this literature? Hey, Gallo. Yo, what's up? What, what about these PEDs? Huh? No. Get them the ground. It's a shame. Always happens to the best. That's it. And joining me is Tyler Gallo. Tyler, how's the night off? Well, you know, you can't get rid of me that easily, Colby, so I'm still here hosting the basketball segment. So let's begin with the basketball. We've seen a lot of transfers recently, and today Dante Tracy announced that he will be transferring. What is going on with the men's basketball team's transfer problem? Well, Colby, it's not just a men's or an RMU men's basketball issue. It's a men's basketball issue across the entire country. As of 8 p.m. tonight, there were 890 names in the transfer portal per verbal commits. And, you know, this is just a growing problem in college basketball this year because they're using that extra year of eligibility. So it's not just an RMU problem, but it's also a league-wide problem. Now, as for RMU, they've had four players in the transfer portal, including A.J. Brahma, Dante Tracy, Cam Wilbon, and Terrell Brown. These four guys were pretty crucial to the team. As you can take a look here, Brahma and Tracy, the two big ones. But I'm going to key in a little bit here on Cameron Wilbon. Now, Wilbon is the only true shooting for, or small forward excuse me, on this team. He's going to be a big loss, but luckily they have Tristan Jeffries coming in as a recruit. Now, Brahma, obviously, that's going to be hard to replicate in, in this league. 15 average points per game and 54% uh, A.J. Brahma is just one of the better players they've had in the last couple of years. Now, Tyler, A.J. Brahma is going to be a big loss, but can you give me your starting five for next year for the men's basketball team? Absolutely, Colby. So there's a lot of players on this team to like now. They didn't lose as many players as the women's team, but I'm going to take a look at the starting center right away is going to be Khalil Spear. He proved exactly why he was going to be the starter this season. I mean, he shot 54%. He came over from the Patriot League and averaged nine points as he started to get into that starting role. Let's take a look here. And now the forward, a transfer in, a very talented player, Justin Winston. He came over from St. Bonaventure, and he averaged eight points during his rookie season in the A-10. He's going to be huge for this team. He's built like Brahma, but a little bit taller. He can slot in immediately, and he's been breaking records at practice, three-point shooting drills. And now Cam Ferris, of course, we saw the promise that he showed last season as a rookie, averaged eight points, and he has lightning quick release from outside. He can shoot like the best of them. Now, now I'm going to take a look at the additions, possibly on the guard, and forward side. They've been talking to some transfers recently from other schools. As, you, as we mentioned earlier, there's 890 names in the transfer portal, so why not reach out to some of them? Uh, the one that I'm going to key in on here is Juan Munoz from Longwood. He's a very important player to that team. He averaged 12 points. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for this team to replace. Take a look here at these transfers. Malik Martin from Monmouth averaged 12 points. And Ferran Flavors, who's a grad student, he's played at three different schools over the past three years. He's going to be, if he gets here somehow, he'll be huge. Now, the transfer problem isn't just for men's basketball. We've seen women's basketball also have a lot of transfer problems as well. So can you tell me a little bit about their issues as well? Well, like I said before, Colby, it's, it's a league-wide problem, and women's basketball currently only has four players listed on the roster. Granted, some of them could come back next season. We haven't really confirmed if any of the seniors that were supposed to be graduating. But take a look here. Megan Callahan has already uh, announced she's going to Youngstown State, staying in the Horizon League, so there's going to be some uh, – she's going to come back here next season and play a couple of games. And then uh, another grad transfer in Holly Forbes is big, and uh, Dahomey Forgues is a big loss. She's pretty speedy and quick, but that's going to be a big loss for this team, even though she came off the bench. 
Now, you did mention the women's basketball team doesn't have a lot of players on the roster right now, but with who they do have, can you give me a starting five that we might see for the women's basketball team next season? Well, a new player you might see is a recruit named Danielle Vuletic, who averaged 21 and 12 at a West Reserve in high school. She's a very big recruit in this class. Uh, she's going to start at the center position for me. And then Sol Castro, I mean, what more can you say about her? She made the uh, all rookie team for the Horizon League, just a huge season of her. And then Castillo has quietly been one of the better players, Esther Castillo, on this team. So she's a big part. Now, I'm going to go with Mackenzie Amelia. She really surprised me down the stretch, especially with that 22-point effort against Purdue Fort Wayne. And now Natalie Villaflor, I have at the forward spot, but that's not her natural position. So there's that. That's there should be an addition in that position. Thank you, Tyler, for joining me, and enjoy the rest of your night off. Thank you, awesome. Colby. Thank you, guys. Now, riding a three-game winning streak in their final series of the year, a home series against NKU on a Monday day-night doubleheader. RMU Volleyball was at home trying to secure another victory and create a four-game winning streak heading into the final game of the year against NKU. Now, you can see here, Maria Alfano, kill out of the middle for Robert Morris to get it started for the Colonials. Abby Ryan, kill to the middle. Colonials up 12 to 6 at that point. Now, next play, big block here by Emma Granger in her senior season, coming back next year. And you can see right there again, Granger with another play out of the middle with a kill, with almost getting a kill there. But there is a tactical overpass by Abby Ryan as RMU was able to win the first set. Now, here's Granger once again putting on her prowess from the service line with the ace, RMU fighting. Once again, Ryan again with the kill, nearly down the line to zone one to put Robert Morris ahead once again. Now, 19-11, Alfano on the slide. And as you can see, once again, RMU takes that second set. Continuing on in the set, RMU now up 24-23, looking for the final point. And there it is, Alyssa Hudak putting it down for the Colonials to get a sweep in this matchup against the Norse to take the first game. Now, RMU now riding a four game winning streak was looking to see if they can make it five against the defending Horizon League regular season champions in the Norse in game two at six o'clock at, at the UPMC Event Center. You can see here the Colonials once again, the slide working well and often for Maria Alfano. Now with Robert Morris up in the first set, six five, another kill, Abby Ryan. Those two, Ryan and Alfano having a great day along with Alyssa Hudak and Emma Granger. Whitney Brown right here. There's a serve ace off a player from Northern Kentucky's head. Not ideal right there. And then a block right there. Scott recommends Mirna Sarnanovich combining on it. Next play. Again, Maria Alfano. But NKU leading into the second set. And right now up 2-0 in the third set right now. Colonial's still struggling. There's a nice play by Abby. Nice play by Alyssa Hudak and Maria Alfano. Now a tip there, but Robert Morris was able to take the third set. Now going to the fourth set, RMU down big, 21-15 at this point. There's Granger out of the middle with another kill, 24 to 20 right here. The final play of the game as RMU not able to get the ball over the net to be able to record a fifth game in the row, dropping their final game after winning four in a row to fall to four and 12 on the season. Now take a look at what the final standing was were for Robert Morris in their first season in the Horizon League. Now, after being in the basement at 0-11, Robert Morris significantly rebounded series is against IUPUI and being able to beat, uh, beat Youngstown State once and being able to defeat NKU in the first game at home. Boosted the Colonials up in the standings ahead of Youngstown State and IUPUI, Colby, in their first year in the Horizon League. Not close to being able to make the Horizon League tournament, but seeing some significant improvement later on in the season. Definitely the team to look at and uh, how the team preparing in their new conference. But when we come back, we're going to have some softball for you here on CSC. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Freedom, it's at the core of who we are. The freedom to live without fear, to jog where we please, 
to wear a hoodie. The freedom to breathe. Before we celebrate the freedom most Americans have, we must fight for the freedom all Americans deserve. Because all lives can't matter until black lives matter. When I first saw Turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with Turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. love. Welcome back to CSC. Now, after a 4-0 beatdown by Wright State, the women's soccer team was looking to get back in the win column. They were looking to do so against Detroit Mercy. Were they able to tame the Titans? Unfortunately, no. The, they were not able to attain the Titans. The Colonials fell to the Titans yesterday 2-1. to one. Tia Joka got the scoring going in the 14th minute for the Titans. She netted a goal. Now to the 61st minute, Karu Hayashi tied the game up. But in the 107th minute, Julie Annie, Julie Ann Piehoski got the game winner. Colonials were outshot 27-14. to 14. Shots on goal were in favor of the Titans 11-7. to 7. The Colonials led the way and saved an 8-6, to 6, but it was not enough. They fell in double overtime to Detroit Mercy. They will take on Cleveland State and Cannonsburg at 1 on Tuesday. Now let's take a look at the soccer standings because it's been an interesting season so far for the Colonials. A bit of a struggle as well. And we see here that Northern Kentucky leads the way. They have 16 points. They're 5-0-1 in the conference. But there at the uh, near the bottom is Robert Morris with three points. They're one and six in conference play. A uh, little, bit, little bit of catching up to do for the Colonials. But as we've seen with most teams in the new conferences here in the Horizon League, it has been a bit of a struggle. Austin, can, tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, it has been a struggle, Colby. It really has. And they really need to try to rebound and really be able to just score some more goals and be able to get some more offense going to be able to truly rebound. But RMU softball was at home on Tuesday against Cleveland State for the 42nd, 43rd matchup ever between the two programs, but the first ever as Horizon League opponents. Now, would Robert Morris be able to defend their territory against the invading Vikings? It was smooth sailing for the Colonials as they parted the Vikings fielders like the Red Sea. After being down 2-0 heading into the bottom of the second, RMU piled on the offense with Elena York, sacrifice fly, scoring Erica Bell, and the riches did not stop there as the team added an additional seven runs to the scoreboard in the inning and a pot of gold for pitcher Jane Garver's run support. And Charlotte Grover also hit a cannonball out of the park as RMU Mercy ruled Cleveland State 10-2 in five innings. Just as Austin said, the softball team smacked Cleveland State 10 to 2. Were they able to conquer the Vikings in game two of this series? Yes, they were. In another mercy rule, they won 16 to 4. The Colonials mercy ruled the Vikings again. In the fourth inning, the Colonials found themselves down 6 to 5. But after a huge fourth inning of nine runs, they were able to win. Natalie Higgins hit a grand slam to make it 14 to 6. Higgins with her fourth home run of the year. Rachel Reinhardt pitched two shutout innings for the Vikings. Jenna Watts was tagged with the loss for giving up four earned runs. The Colonials will host Oakland for a doubleheader tomorrow and Saturday. Now, before taking on Cleveland State, Robert Morris headed over the weekend to Green Bay to take on the Phoenix. Now, would Robert Morris be able to not let the Phoenix take off and fly? Well, the bird has definitely landed, but the Colonials were the one facing some increased turbulence. After catching fire early in the season, pitcher Dana Vitekis struggled mightily against Green Bay giving up eight runs and only an inning in a third pitch. Samantha Saloon and Crystal Guzman each drove in three runs for the Phoenix as RMU committed four errors and only collected one hit in five innings, being mercy ruled by the Phoenix 13 to nothing. Just as Austin said, the Colonials did not have a good game after a shellacking of 13 nothing at the hands of Green Bay. Were they able to turn around in game two of this series? Unfortunately, no, they fell. In the first, Alyssa Brewer's only hit was blasted to left field, which drove in three runs for the Phoenix. They were able to score two more times. In the fourth, Natalie Higgins' only hit was a home run as well, as she drove in two runs. Brittany Benek struck out seven as she got the win. Rachel Reinhardt was tagged with the loss. The Phoenix were able to jump out to an early lead, and they never looked back. Five to two, Phoenix. Now, Colby, after dropping the first two games to Green Bay, RMU turned to Madison Riggle to try to get some solidarity and support on the mound and guide Robert Morris to a win. But again, 
third time was not the charm for the Colonials, dropping 9-2 to two with the Phoenix to the Phoenix. Riggle was rattled and really struggled. The struggle was real for the Colonials. She allowed five runs, four earned in only two-thirds of an inning pitch with Dana Vitekis relieving her for the rest of the afternoon as Green Bay was read by B Brittany Bannock to a 9-2 to victory and Faith Miller and Char Charvet Grover for Robert Mar Morris both hit well with Grover hitting her first home run of the season but dropping Robert Morris under 500 on the season to 7-8. and eight. After an abysmal three games against the Phoenix, were Robert Morris was looking to get in the win column. Were they finally able to beat the Phoenix? And they finally did. They won 6-5. to five. A big day from Natalie Higgins. She went 3-4 for four with one home run and four RBIs. Faith Miller went 1-3 for three and had a double along with them. For the Phoenix, Samantha Saloon with three, went 3-3 three for three with an RBI. After the third inning, the game was tied at three. In the seventh, the Colonials scored two runs and led the Colonials to be 8-8 on, on the year against the Vikings. It looks like the Colonials will have to save their tears for another day because they got the win. That's definitely right, Colby. But let's see where the Colonials are right now in the softball standings in their first season in the Horizon League. Now, so far, they've performed pretty well, Colby. Right now, fifth in the conference and currently right now five and five in conference play 10 and eight overall ended up moving up to over 500 but still with oakland uic youngstown state and green bay who gave them fits in the frozen tundra still above the colonials in the horizon league standings colby but i i'd like to think that right now they're doing pretty well with seeing a lot of other teams in for robert morris sports transition in horizon league and not having as great a success as softball was having right now yeah definitely some success for the softball team as they continue to try to move up in the standings but it's a nice sign to see them sweeping cleveland state and able to get a win against the phoenix but when we come back john hannah will be talking about golf here on csc what to expect when you're expecting a teenager Today we're talking about how to wake up your teen, and this works literally every time. Good kisses. Good kisses. You heard how loud I know, I heard. I heard. It wasn't you. It was the... Is that bacon? You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Welcome back to Colonial Sports Center. John Hanna, our producer, is down at the island to get us into the golf season as they as they began it. John? Thanks, guys. I'm here at the Golf Dome at the RMU Island Sports Center here on Neville Island. The men's golf team was in action this past week as they traveled to Worthington Manor Golf Club in Urbana, Maryland for the Carpetbagger Classic. The Colonials were looking to get into the swing of the 2021 season as their 2020 season was postponed due to COVID. And the Colonials would do just that as they finished third in the Carpetbagger Classic at 29 over par, nine shots off the winner, a familiar foe and former NEC opponent Fairleigh Dickinson. The middle of the pack in this one was fairly competitive as the third place Colonials and last place Mount St. Mary's were separated by only six strokes. Individually, the Colonials were led by two top 10 performances by Chris Sable and Chase Miller. Sable finished in a three-way tie for sixth at four over par, while Miller finished in a tie for tenth, a stroke behind Sable. Bucknell's Jamie Jewell and Fairleigh Dickinson's Jack Gardner tied for first overall at one over par. The Colonials are in action next weekend as they travel to Penn National Golf Club in Fayetteville, Pennsylvania for a date at the Fairleigh Dickinson Invitational. For Colonial Sports Center, I'm John Hanna. Send it back to you guys in the studio. Nice shot, John. Oh, great snack, Colby. <laughs> now, that was very interesting and good for the golf team. 
Yeah, it's good to see golf back, especially not having a season last year. It's really good to see just everybody for Robert Morris play this season. And here's some upcoming games with softball on Friday and Saturday. Track is in action as well as softball and women's lacrosse. Sunday, Kobe rowing is in action. Whoa. I know you're big on rowing. And Tuesday, men's soccer and women's soccer will play at South Point, Colby. Devs, definitely very excited for that. For Austin Bechtold, I'm Colby Sherwin. Thank you for joining us here on Colonial Sports Center. I'm sorry, Colby. You did not.